السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد ولا تهنوا ولا تحزنوا وأنتم الأعلون إن كنتم مؤمنين صدق الله العظيم وقال تعالى ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين. So my dear brothers and sisters, our dear friends, um, we can't escape the fact that for the last few weeks and maybe for the next few weeks, everybody is interested in this FIFA World Cup. Everybody is discussing the World Cup, and mashallah, there's been many occasions uh, for Muslims to be very very happy and excited and to celebrate almost and you see many many muslims muslim countries muslim individuals from all around the world celebrating feeling a sense of pride and so on uh, at the same time there's lots of questions uh, for those who are concerned generally uh, there, there's a lot of concern about exactly how far we can go with this joy and how far we can go with this excitement and what is allowed and actually what is not allowed uh, should we be celebrating, should we be supporting Qatar, who are holding this Muslim country that is holding the World Cup, holding the FIFA World Cup? So, um, I decided to look at, I'm not a football person at all, not supported a team in as far as I can remember, and I'm not really into it, I've not watched a full match at all, right? If somebody's been watching something and they say, look at this goal, and you know, I may have like peeked over on a little screen or something, but I've not watched anything at all. But it's important for us to discuss this. And the one thing really interesting is that, mashallah, this is the first time that a Muslim country has put their neck out there and secured the World Cup. And that's not an easy thing to do. These are big countries that generally do this. And for a very, 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 very small country to do this, that is a major achievement. We're not here to praise Qatar. We're not here because that's not beneficial for us. It's not a praise game here. This is a Jumu'ah Bayan. It's a you know, part of our Jumu'ah service. So it's not a place just to you know, praise somebody. It's the lessons we can learn from what has happened. So that we can then, from that macro lesson, maybe we can apply some micro lessons. And we can contribute to the betterment of the world from some of the lessons and the challenges that this has provided. And that's really what I want to do is just analyze it a bit. Uh, first and foremost... We have, to, uh, we, we have to point out the fact that sticking to your principles is very, very important. And that is something that we've noticed from this. Sticking to your principles. Very relevant to us because we live in, uh, as a minority, Muslims are a minority community within the broader non-Muslim community, people of other faiths and so on. And a lot of the time we have the same challenge of leave your religion at the door of your workplace. You can be religious, but when you come to the workplace, when you come to school, when you go wherever you go, there should be no religion there. Religion is a private thing. But in Islam, religion is not just a private thing. It has many, many public manifestations. In fact, Jumu'ah is a public manifestation. Eid is a public manifestation. The hijab is a public manifestation as soon as you go out. And, and, and so on. There's a number of other rules that uh, relate to interpersonal relationships into community relationship, into religious relationships. Islam is totalizing and there's no, uh, there's no way to uh, be apologetic about that. And if anybody is and they leave the Islam by the door, then that's really difficult. That's, uh, that's, uh, that, that, that means we're not uh, fully entering into Islam. Uh, so now what, has, what can we draw from what Qatar has done? At the end of the day, this is a small country somehow. However, they secured the World Cup. That's besides the point here. Right? Whatever they did, we don't know. But they, got, they secured it. And then after that, they stuck to their principles. And that's what I'm personally most amazed about. And they played it strategically. There was no discussion of banning alcohol beforehand. As far as I've been told, it was only two days before that they mentioned this point. And that was too late. Everybody had brought their tickets. Uh, many people had already there. You don't cancel something. Uh, so they played it very strategically. And then they stuck to that that there will be no, that it was banned in the stadiums, at least in the stadiums it was banned. They may have allowed it in certain very restricted, uh, you know, cases or restricted places, but not in the stadium. And of course, there was an uproar about that. 
But then there's been so many positive, positive reactions to that, that it's just a much, creates a much better atmosphere. The women and children feel a lot more secure because there are no rowdy, drunk people after a match going and causing nuisance or within the match causing a nuisance. And you just see that and compare that to many other matches where the drink is fr flowing freely and then what would happen in that because everybody really knows that drink does cause those kind of things. You might want to be blind to it for a while when you want to indulge, just like we know that too much cheesecake is bad, but then we just, uh, you know, ignore that part when we want to enjoy it for, uh, you know, for some time. There's no, there's no comparison between cheesecake and wine, by the way, or beer, for that matter. So they played it very, very well. Um, everybody, when I heard, and I said, I'm not into football, I don't do any of this kind of stuff, but when I heard that the BBC did not show the opening ceremony, I got curious. I said, what, what, what was so bad about this ceremony? They didn't want to show it. And then I realized. And if you look at this, and I looked at it, I just scanned through it. And what I noticed in there is that there were very few women represented in there. Right? There were very, very few women, if at all. Um, of course, there was a bit of music. There was a lot of drum music. I saw this guy playing a drum or something like that. And Allah Ta'ala forgive us. And then it was mostly dark. So you couldn't really see uh, individuals, you couldn't really see much nakedness at all. I mean, there, I don't think there was much nakedness, there wasn't much nakedness at all. Right? So I think all of that was premeditated. Because uh, while I was looking at this, or looking for this, I saw opening ceremonies of other World Cups. And right, straight away, you can tell the big difference. There's just so much nudity. There is just so much more being displayed in the other ones, if you look at the Beijing or whatever. It's a massive deal, and I think this is premeditated. And then, mashallah, to have started with a verse of the Qur'an, right? For the first time ever, something like that on such a... Because when BBC doesn't want to do something, you know that something's probably happening which is right, right? So, those are the things that I noticed from there, that it must have been very premeditated. It wasn't something... I mean, I would expect that other countries who may have won it to may have not had that principled stance. They would have just outsourced all of this. Qataris outsource everything, uh, such as what the Gulf countries do. I mean, it's Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis and Westerners that are doing everything down there, but it seems like they had a grip on all of this. They managed the whole thing. That means stick to your principles. Now, I know that... There, there's a, there could have been abuses and there could have been all of the other stuff and there could be a truth to all of that and maybe it is true, part of it and all of that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, we want to look at the positives of it because there's negatives and positives in everything. We can't dismiss the positives just because of some negatives. We call out the negatives, but it's very important to understand the positives. And if Muslims feel good about this, it brought a lot of the nations together that were supposed to be enemies before. When one team won, they all came together because you felt like you know, when people, when Morocco wins, people think, uh, you know, Muslims get happy. When Tunisia wins, Muslims get happy, even though you may have never been to Tunisia. They may have never been to Morocco. There's this global affinity within the Ummah. I know this isn't, you know, this isn't some major battle or something like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is a little thing that people have, people have enjoyed. And the major thing is that they prepared it in a way. If it's true, what they say, I haven't been there, but from people, uh, you know's reports the da'wah that has taken place for a lot of the people that went there. So maybe there may have been less people from the uh, Western Europe, but a lot of people from South America and a lot of other, other countries have turned up there. They still have full stadiums. And mashallah, so many people converting to Islam, being able to see a Muslim way of life. And that's really important to see because the Qataris are really apparently showing a lot of their hospitality and serving the people, talking to them. Uh, welcoming them and that is amazing because that is Muslim lifestyle and the whole thing has in the West become a Muslim thing a Muslim uh, a Muslim issue not just a Qatari issue clearly it's uh, anybody who's critiquing it from the West is critiquing it because it's Islamic and they don't want that to happen but it was too late after they secured it I don't know how many years ago it was just too late so from this the one thing that has really come out is the hypocrisy at the end of the day if you're trying to please someone, you have to realize whether they can be pleased or not, and not at what cost can they be pleased. I think we really have to understand that. And once you understand that, then you realize whether it's worth trying to please somebody or not. Whether it's worth spending your whole life sacrificing, giving up, chopping, destroying your own principles because you want to please somebody for what? 
for a little few, you know, for a little few gains, right? And yet there's other people who don't do that and alhamdulillah, they still survive and they still are successful. But they win the dunya and the akhirah. And if you make those kind of sacrifices where you have to give up your principles, you might win a bit more of the dunya. You may become Mo from Muhammad for a few days, you know, of your life or Sam from Aslam. But at the end of the day, what's going to be there for them the hereafter? Because you've already tried to get what you want and not had the sacrifice. Allah tests us. So I think this really treat, uh, teaches that a little, a little small country, a small country like that, stick to their principles. And then on the whole LGBT issue. And then mashallah, their spokesman, they've chosen the right spokesman. I think that's another lesson that we have to learn, that you need the right spokespeople. Whenever we have problems in the Muslim community related to either schools or something else that happened, we don't have the right spokespeople to be able to provide the right narrative that needs to be provided there. A lot of the time it's the really heated up people who shout and they really mess up the situation even worse. Now this guy, I mean the explanation was that the reasons why we cannot accept uh, the LGBTQ is you have to understand that in the West it's about individual rights. That trumps everything. Individual. If somebody wants to feel that way, then we need to support that. Whereas where we come from, uh, well, meaning he's saying that where we are, it's about community rights. There's a community trend and custom and culture that has to be maintained over individual rights. It's another way of thinking. But when you're in the West, you don't understand that because it's become so ingrained in us. This postmodern thinking that tr you, whatever you think is true, whatever I think is true, even though they're both opposites, as long as we don't harm each other, you, 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 know, you can go ahead and think what you, say, what you think is true, do what you want to do, I can do what I want to do as long as I don't harm each other. That means that it's about the individual. The individual is God, almost. I mean, that's in other words. Whereas there, it's more about the community. It's about community ethics, community culture. And that was, that's a good argument that if, if somebody listens to in a calm way, they will understand that uh, that's another point of view. And hopefully that means that they will have less poison when they speak about these things. So the dawah aspect of it, that they actually prepared the dawah aspect, calling dawah people mu'adhins, opening up masjids, having dawah programs. And mashallah, and then really at the end of the day, I think what really matters is actions speak louder than words. So it looks like they actually showed it. They stuck to their principles. They gave the da'wah. And they tried to convince people of the beauty of Islam. The, uh, the, the rightly chosen verses, hadiths, everywhere, so that people can, because people are hungry today. It's just they don't get exposure to these things. We saw even with this that the uh, major media outlets don't want to put in the ceremony. They don't let the people see the sajdas, the prostrations performed by some of the players, right? You, you, you see that, and that's all the hypocrisy. They don't want to show the religion because religion is very powerful. And why don't they show it? If it wasn't so powerful, if it wasn't so significant, why would they, why would they refuse to show it? But they turn away from that. They will show other sports people doing their weird signs or whatever it is, and that's fine. That's signature signs that others do but they won't show Muslims doing it. Why? Because there's a profound impact somewhere, right? It's having an impact because Islam has its own power, right? I mean, if people were to look at Islam uh, and understand Islam or try to understand Islam from looking at us, they may get turned off. But somehow they look at the book first and they look at the Quran and they understand what it is and they see the beauty of it. Because sometimes we individuals, some individuals put people off Islam. So actions speak louder than words. And I think the one thing that I have to mention out of all of this, how does such a small country right, win the World Cup and then make sure FIFA's on their side and then they manage to make sure that all of their principles are adhered to to the best of their ability despite going against every other convention of a World Cup beforehand, the no alcohol and all of the rest of it and standing up to the pressures against them for not allowing such and such because they've got a lot of money. That's the only way you're going to pull this off. And why am I even mentioning this? The only way you can pull something off is you can, you can use your money. And what's the lesson in that for us? And this is a hadith which says that there will come a time and the only thing of benefit will be dinars and dirhams, pounds and dollars or whatever. Because... That's such a small country, they've done so many things that 
are anti-Western, yet they have uh, an American base there. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing or what strategy that is. I, I'm not a politician. I'm not into political science. So I could be totally off the mark here. But one thing that's for sure, that you can't pull this through and then stand your position and have yourself you know, uh, succeed in this unless you've got a lot of money. That means we need to have money. That's very, very important. But money that is channeled in the right direction, not money that is for selfish gains only. Now the World Cup, yes, lots of money was spent in that, huge amounts of money, multiple times more than spent anywhere else. Of course, things have become a bit expensive, but even if you factor that in, there's a lot of money. Of course, they, uh, the Qataris are saying that now they have a tube system, a metro system, and their own infrastructure is benefiting, and so on. Yes, a lot of that money could have been spent elsewhere. They could have alleviated poverty from so many different places. They could have talked about Palestine. And, and mashallah, there is a lot of discussion about Palestine anyway taking place. That just, mashallah, seems to be in the consciousness of the Muslim ummah, alhamdulillah. We can say, I'm sure the Palestinians are happy, Muslims are happy that Palestine is in the consciousness of the Muslim Ummah, which is very, very important. You know, when you see the clips from there about fans and even others challenging the idea, that just shows that even among non-Muslims, if you give them a scope to see the right narrative, they will take the right course because that's human being to do that. It's just when you constantly bombard people with the wrong narratives in multiple <coughs> fields, then you lead people because people are like sheep. And this is, this is the problem. But you need money. And even in the same thing in this country, there's a lot of other groups in the world that have gotten somewhere because of money. Because you need to campaign, right? And people work with money. Al insan wa abdul ihsan. The human being is a slave to, to, to gratitude, to, to assistance, to benevolence, to, to goodness. And that, that is very, very important. We really need to focus. And mashallah, the Muslim community does have a lot of money. After 60 years of being in this country, the Muslims do have a lot of disposable income. The problem is, what I have seen, is that a lot of the people who have money, they never, they haven't sat down, they haven't sat down, and really think about this. Many people who have a big individual worth, they haven't ever sat down and thought, let me really count how much money I've got. They do that to see how much they can invest, but they have never sat down to say, I've got a lot of money, let me actually see how much I'm making, to see how much I could really comfortably give for another cause, except my own selfish gain, 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 gain. Really, I don't think a lot of people have done that. They've got huge amounts of money swirling around in their various investments, but they have sat down to think, I need to do something else. Let me see how much I can do, whatever that is. I'll give you an example, a masjid was being built somewhere in one of the local areas, and they, went, they said bus drivers came and gave them 10,000 pounds of their savings. Bus drivers, which saved up money, gave him 10,000 pounds. The individual went to a big property tycoon who buys a house every month, who can buy every month with his profits, a 700,000 pound house. That's his profit from his portfolio. So he can buy a new house for worth 7, 700,000 pounds, which many of us struggle to, you know, to even think about. And he said he didn't give me anything. He has to buy that next house because he has to add one more to the 150 or 200 he already has. Because that guy's never thought about it. He's just thinking money, money, whatever he's been driven for. His parents brought him up that way. We need to succeed. What do you mean by success in the world? A lot of us bring up our children to succeed, which means just get lots of money. That's shallow. That's only going to take you to the end of this world. That's not going to take you to the hereafter. That has no benefit if it's just succeed in terms of make lots of money so you can be comfortable, so you don't have to do what me and my dad had to do, which was to struggle. So you can have a nice house and a nice car. That's ridiculous. There has to be some more of what you can do with your money. And this is what we're missing in this country right now. There's, Alhamdulillah, there's lots of people now coming up where they've, take, they've made that calculation in their mind, I've got a lot of money and I can actually put 10% towards good deeds. There's, there's one madrasa that just needed their whole boiler system. There's two guys who literally gave them 70,000 free. They're making money, but they've also made a calculation that we can give. And then they also believe in the fact that the more I give, the more Allah will give me. That's what's missing. This is, if you think about it, this is what's missing. So really, go home today if you think you've got some money and be thankful to Allah and make that calculation. What can I separate? This is not a fundraiser, right? Uh, Dr. Atiyah is not here. Right? It's not a fundraiser, but really this thing I've been, I've been thinking, because this is the only way we can progress our Muslim, because we need the money. The Qatar has shown that you need money to get somewhere. 
Otherwise, nobody else would have got that. So, uh, we ask Allah to forgive us and our mistakes, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us and assist us in what we do. And uh, we thank all of those who've done a great, great job. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow many, many good, more good things. And may Allah forgive them for the bad things. And wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand, whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam, and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.